Thank you everybody for joining us, our panelists, and we're obviously we're going to um, introduce everybody, but uh, I do want to uh, thank everyone for sharing their time with us. We've allotted two hours for this. Sounds like a lot. We won't go over two hours. If we go under, that's okay. But, uh, you know, and if you have to leave us uh, early, that's okay too, because as I mentioned, we will, we will be posting this post-conversation. Uh, I'm meteorologist Natasha Ramsahai, for those of you who don't know. I am a meteorologist with City News, 680 News, and sometimes on breakfast television, all under the Rogers Media umbrella. Um, I saw a post from Brown Girl Diary last week, it was probably last Wednesday or Thursday, reached out to them, and um, it was about uh, Indo-Caribbean, uh, Indo-Caribbeans support Black Lives Matter, um, and I have been wanting to find a way to sort of talk about the racial tensions within our community, within the ca Caribbean. When I say our community, I'm talking about within the Caribbean. I cannot speak for the world. We have no intention of speaking for whole ethnic races today. We are going to talk about our experiences and our stories and, and uh, personal stories. And just to make sure that everyone knows this is a space, a safe space for dialogue. Old ways don't open new doors. I'm sure you've heard this. So uh, if we stay silent about this, it means compliance and it just means that we're helping to maintain the systemic racism within our society and the community and it ensures its survival. And we're trying to break that down. Um, the conversations today, of course, uh, surrounding race were sparked by the killing of George Floyd and the ensuing protests all around the world the strengthening of the Black Lives Matter movement and the diversity of people now willing to have these conversations. The people who are marching are not all black. And that is a wonderful thing to see because now this is a global uh, movement, truly global movement, one that the world has never seen before. Um, we wanna be allies to our black brothers and sisters and we hear you and we want you to know that we're here to make this lifelong commitment. So with that, uh, I'm going to throw to Amala. So Amala is one of our panelists, and we're going to find out more about Amala in a, in a moment. But she is our mental health specialist. Her areas of expertise, cultural diversity, anti-oppressive practice, equity, and justice. Uh, we do want Amala to uh, give us a land acknowledgement and some guidelines for what's going to be going on today. So thank you, Amala. Over to you. Sure, thank you. Thanks, Natasha. So as Natasha said, my name is uh, Amala Bash. I'm a social worker and instructor at Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, so to start, I recognize we already had that where are you from conversation. Um, and it didn't go to the uh, no, where are you from from, but before that. Um, so maybe that's to come. But um, I recognize that we have guests from many communities, but I'll be starting with a land acknowledgement for the city of Hamilton, which is where I'm currently located. So for those of you who've never uh, heard this before, a land acknowledgement is an important way of beginning all of our racial justice work and specifically this conversation on anti-Black racism as we recognize that this is not separate from conversations about the injustices that have been brought upon Indigenous communities here and back home. And as we attempt to enhance our understanding of the interlocking nature of oppression and the shared histories and struggles, specifically of Black and Indigenous communities, again, both here in North America and back home in the West Indies. Um, land acknowledgements call our attention to the colonization of these lands, and it disrupts this notion of European dominance um, or right to the land. So the city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered with, uh, by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase of 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, this city of Hamilton is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, which is North America, and we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can do better to understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. So I encourage all of you to use, uh, there are fantastic sites out there, um, but one really great one is native-land.ca, um, as in, in our anthem, our home and native land to find out whose land you are on. And as we dive into these conversations about race, identity, and relation, it's very important for us to understand our own position. So with that being said, I would like to offer some uh, guidelines for the conversation 
as was already mentioned. Um, the reason that we have come together in this space is due to the recent murders of Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor in the United States and Regis Korczynski Paquet here in Canada. We will be talking specifically about all facets of anti-Black racism, including things like police brutality, uh, structural and state sanctioned violence. We'll not be showing any graphic images or videos um, depicting any of this violence, but it's very important to engage in honest and critical conversation, which means that we need to be frank about the nature of violence that Black people experience. Um, and because this is an inherently difficult conversation, uh, I urge everyone to take good care of yourselves throughout our time together and afterwards. Um, likely, there'll be a lot of feelings that come up. Um, maybe anger, resentment, sadness, frustration, hopelessness. Um, and it's very important for us to acknowledge all of these different responses and use them to gain insight into our own behavior, our own implicit biases. Um, and this might be difficult because through this conversation, we might be acknowledging harm that we ourselves might have caused, um, anti-Black racism and sen sentiments that we ourselves have participated in. So uh, we're all well aware that everyone here is on very different learning paths with regards to anti-racism. Um, some of us have been doing this for years while others are, uh, you know, we might be hearing some of these terms for the first time. Um, so today we might just be scratching the surface with this learning. Um, and again, another guideline is please acknowledge and recognize that this is just the beginning. There's a lot more that can be said and that needs to be said. So um, welcome to this space. I hope you view this as a uh, starting point um, that gives you the confidence and capacity to move forward in your learning. Thank you. Thank you, Amala. Um, we are going to get started because look, I say that um, it's only or, or two hours is a long time and we're seven minutes in already. So the time goes fast. We want to cover so much space here. I know some view, uh, viewers have just joined us right now. So we're asking you to please mute your mic, uh, turn off your video and, and not to share your video or mic and that will keep the grid and the, and the panel just on the panelists. Um, so this is part one of the Levi Talkna series uh, because we really wanted to talk about how to talk to our parents, how to talk to our partners and how to talk to our mixed Indo-Afro-Caribbean heritage children. And this is all gonna take place over the next three Thursdays. Uh, two main questions that we're going to be addressing today. What did anti-Blackness look like growing up in your house, in your community, as an Indo-Caribbean family? And have you talked to your parents or your uncles, older family members? Have you talked to Auntie so-and-so? What was the outcome? Did it go well? Did it not? How can we do it better? Um, and, and give you some of the tools and resources to take away with you today. We're not, again, in any way trying to speak for a whole um, region of the world because everyone has their own journeys. Um, some are going to relate to these topics, others will not, as Amala just said. So just come here with an open heart, open mind. We're leaving all judgment at the door. We're not trying to shame anybody. Emotions may get stirred up here, as Amala mentioned. Uh, the important thing is that we're talking. So let's uh, get right into our panelists. We want everybody to give a short introduction um, of themselves. I'll go back to Amala first, since we've already heard your voice and people want to know more about you. Uh, you are our mental health specialist on this panel. Well, tell us a little bit more about your personal experience and why you felt it was important to be here with us today. Amala. Oh, the host has to unmute. There we okay, go. there we go. It's <laughs> Zoom, I'm right? not the host. Hold on. I just yeah. to technical. Okay. <laughs> Zoom, so, so I need that permission to speak. So thank you. Thank okay. you for that. Um, so I'm of Indo-Caribbean descent. Um, I was born in Scarborough, as we already established. And uh, both of my parents are from Guyana, as you might be able to see. Kaitra Falls right there. <laughs> I didn't just put it up for this panel though. Uh, that's been there. Um, so I've been a practicing social worker for a little over a decade, um, specifically working in a variety of fields, including child welfare and uh, social justice and community social work. Um, uh, currently, I'm teaching, which I have been doing on contract for the past five years um, in the Faculty of Social Work at Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, on a more personal note, and sort of my interest in this panel is that um, I am of Indo-Caribbean descent and my partner is African American. Um, so I know that that, different, um, that experience is very different than being of Afro-Caribbean descent. Um, 
but I think that having a biracial child, being in an interracial partnership, um, and being a social worker who's very invested in anti-racism work, um, I'm really, really excited about this, about this panel and this conversation and how we can move forward with these conversations. Thanks. That's great. Uh, I, I feel you. I, my partner is also African American. He's on the call right now as well. So um, when we get to next week's session, right, when we're talking to our partners and how to support them, I think this is going to be very important. All right, we're heading over to Atika Khan right now. So in my grid, she's above Amala. I don't know if everyone's grid is the same. Uh, Atika is our historian. We cannot talk about the Indo Afro Caribbean racial tensions without talking about the history and how it all started and where it came from. So um, she's a historian of Guyanese Canadian heritage is a doctoral candidate at McMaster University. So tell us about what you're working on uh, right there. And again, your personal reasons for being here today. Hey, thanks, Natasha. Hi, so my name is Atika, as Natasha mentioned. Um, I was born in Guyana. I was born in uh, Berbice, and then I spent the first 12 years of my life in Lenora in the West Coast. So, um, and after that, we migrated to Canada. So I have a diasporic experience that I think a lot of you will be familiar with, um, Indo-Caribbean heritage, and then having migrated to the West. Um, and so that's the, those are my personal reasons for, for you know, being invested in a project like this. And then my professional reasons are that, you know, the last eight years I've spent studying uh, Guyana's history, looking at the different sort of facets of um, race, ethnicity, religion, the different kinds of organizations that were established in the 20th century, and how these have, you know, led to the events of today or yesterday even. And so um, when you see, for example, documents that were written in 1962 um, that can be, you know, put back in the newspaper today without an edit, uh, you, you become really concerned, or at least I did, that 50 years have not made a significant difference, or one could say it hasn't made a significant difference. So I think these grassroots, grassroots conversations about race and racism within our own households and our own communities are a great way to start to build toward you know, a project of peace and long-term, uh, I, I wanna say cohesion, but even if not cohesion, then at least alliance. Thank you. Um, we also wanted to have people that have lived back home and lived here in Canada. So we're trying to give the, uh, not the Canadian perspective, at least the Toronto experience, because I know if you're growing up in Toronto uh, with a Caribbean background, it's very different than growing up in other parts of the country. So of course we invited Joan Pierre on. Um, I've worked with Joan on many projects in the past. She has a multifaceted career. Uh, in the public and private sectors. She's a producer, event planner. She's been in production and stage management, marketing and communications, artistic and creative direction. Um, she's played a huge role in big events within the Caribbean community, including Caravana, the African Heritage Music Festival in New Orleans, the U of T Faculty of Law 50th Reunion, the Afro-Anglican Conference, African, like what have you not done, Joan, for real? Um, and uh, the Cut in Style fashion show. So uh, I'm gonna pass it over to you because I can go on and on about all of the events that you've done for our community. But um, tell us a bit more about your, your background growing up and your personal reasons for uh, agreeing to be with us today. Thank you, Sita. 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 <laughs> No, I've got it wrong. You see what I mean? <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. It's all the You're time welcome, you spend on the beach. <laughs> okay. Okay, Joan. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about, about yourself. Okay. Um, growing up in Trinidad is where I would start. I mean, you said all this stuff about event planning. That's, that's my world. That's my passion. I have no intentions of retiring. I don't care, I'm gonna do it until I don't know when. So that part of me is my passion and I love it. But growing up in Trinidad, um, it was very interesting at the era that I grew up in Trinidad, which I will share during this, this two hours because it's different to what it is now. And, and what made it change is a lot of politics that came into being in the last, let's say 20 years so there, there are many differences, but I mean, if we go back to Trinidad and the difference between the African community and the East Indian community and why they were the way they were way back in the 40s, 50s and 60s, 
it has all to do with how they got to the island. Right. That's the reason why the differences came about and how when we were British, when the British came in, they kept that divide and conquer sort of approach to the two to, to different groups and kept them separated in a certain way. So we talk right. more about that and I'm really happy to be here um, to share my experience and to learn from others on this panel, uh, things I may not know, but um, we'll see as we go along. Amazing, thank you, thank you, Joan. Mm -hmm. All right, we are going to also um, introduce you to Sita Ram Kalawan Singh. So she's a feminist city builder. She was born in Trinidad, lived in Toronto for decades, but also uh, has that voice for us from back home and here as well. So um, a little bit about Sita, I know you're gonna tell us as well. She has a long call list as well <laughs> of the work that she's done. Um, a specialist on community engagement, diversity management, an experienced board committee member in the nonprofit and institutional sectors. Uh, she's worked a really important role at, with the school trustees at the TDSB, a Toronto School Board, to develop anti-racism and multicultural policies and programs. She's won numerous awards for her work as well, or received numerous uh, uh, awards for her work. Uh, so tell us a bit more about yourself as well, Sita, and your reasons for joining us here this evening. Well, I, I felt my arm being twisted by Joan Pierre. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I think this is a very important conversation uh, to have. And uh, certainly, um, you know, the different experiences of people of African origin and people of East Indian origin in Trinidad, which is where I was born, where I lived until I was about 15, and then our family moved to Canada. Uh, I observed that as a child. Uh, and I, you know, the question got raised about uh, our family, how our families address these differences, but I guess we'll get into that uh, in greater, greater detail later on. Um, you know, I, I feel it's important to, to give back, to be in the community, to, to, to really try to make change where you are. Uh, it, you can't uh, make change by entering into somebody else's arena. So that where I have lived in my neighborhood, where I have gone to school at the University of Toronto, where I have worked at City Hall, at the school board, at various places, are all places where I have engaged in making some kind of change because I don't think I I because I think you can make change most from where you are even though you can be supportive of other struggles and other fights but uh, you got to start with who you are and where you are located absolutely absolutely and that's why home is where everybody is located so we're hoping and home looks very different for a lot of people it's, we're not talking white picket fence two dogs and you know a, a mom and dad um, everybody's home looks different but we all have relatives and friends that hopefully we can spread this word to and so that now brings me to butterfly sabrina gopal age of 14 midtown toronto already living in a group home uh but and i say but because um people in that circumstance aren't expected to do anything with their lives, that's what we're told, right? But she graduated in journalism, print and broadcast in 2006 from Humber College. Uh, first brown woman and single mother who earned the Board of Governors Achievement Award. Congratulations on that. And she's also importantly an active member of the Jane Finch Action Against Poverty, the head news correspondent for janefinch.com and uh, for more than 10 years, she's worked at Black Creek Community Health Center. So when you're talking, when she was talking about making change at home and in the community where you are, this is Butterfly. So Butterfly, welcome. And hey uh, tell us, hi, tell us, tell us, go ahead, tell us about- What this. a flow, well done with the programming. Yes, um, <laughs> I'm still on um, a high. We had our Jane and Finch Black Creek Community graduation today. It was online, there was steel pen all over the neighborhood, and we all met up at Jane and Finch as well as virtually, so I, I'm still really on that, that, um, that wave. Um, so, so 
I, I'm born in Canada. I was born in Regent Park, um, and I, I moved in the Jane and Finch area in the 80s. Um, I, I, you know, like, like my sister Natasha mentioned, I, I did end up in a group home at 14, and, you know, coming back to Jane and Finch, that group home was at St. Clair and Christie, and it was a world away from my world, and I wanted to come back. Um, shortly after I came back, I had my first son, and um, he's a black black boy his father is Jamaican and I, I have another son with another dad um, many years later who's eight um, so I've been living in this neighborhood I've been part of JFAP and Black Creek Community Health Center um, and I think I've been really fortunate to be an activist in JFAP spaces but be able to push uh, within community health spaces um, social justice and equity issues um, I think we're going to get into it, um, but being on the streets at a young age, um, being in a group home, pro predominantly white folks, um, and, and, and meeting staff that were racialized and Black, um, and kind of even seeing employment inequities from that time. Um, you know, white staff had the full-time day jobs, and the cool staff that I really connected with were nighttime, and I was in bed or on the weekend. Um, and even at that time, uh, you know, girls um, that might be, you know, out of, um, I don't know, out of the margins, um, really, really felt injustice and organized. So I remember as a young woman in the group home where there were um, organizing that was happening where uh, white residents were organized with white staff and racialized and black residents were organized with racialized and black staff. Um, whether I had the context or not, um, I think growing up in the Jane and Finch area, being exposed to that experience at a young age um, um, and navigating that through my family, it's not like I left, up, I left home and there's no family. Um, they still love me and um, you know, and that was a journey that's a journey in itself in, in having um, my first son Z at um, 18 in 1995. Um, so politically there was Mike Harris and also um, our realities as, um, uh, and it's interesting, I identify as a Caribbean Guyanese woman. Indo-Caribbean is, is something that um, I do identify, but if there's boxes for me to check, I check Caribbean. Yeah. So I'll leave it at that. You're lucky you there is a box called Caribbean. Usually I check. Other. Oh, I make the box. The other, <laughs> the other I put okay. Caribbean. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna make the box from now on then. <laughs> but at health centers, we do have that box. We do at health centers. Very nice. I love it. I love it. Love it. Thank you for your story. I'm sad that I have never met you before, but I'm happy that now I get to go forth uh, with you and uh, and then sort of um, be a, a comrade of yours. So I'm happy for that. Uh, okay, lastly on our panel, not last, but uh, certainly not least, Rocky Nibar. She's a communications professional uh, committed to showcasing a story, born in Trinidad and Tobago, moved to Canada in the 90s. Um, currently, she is the Brown Girl Diaries Research Coordinator. So tell us a bit more about Brown Girl Diaries and yourself as well and your background. Rocky. Hi everybody. Um, yes, my name is Mary Perry. So um, I'm so glad to have this conversation and be part of this conversation today. Um, so us at Brown and Girl Diary, we are all about cultivating, creating, and collaborating to, you know, understand and uncover the Indo-Caribbean women experience um, surrounding identity and culture. So um, us at Brown Girl Diary, we offer um, different programs and events and workshops um, for young women, which are, you know, currently on hold with COVID. Um, we are also a, a voice for um, Indo-Caribbean women uh, through our blogs, um, through visual products, um, and uh, we're also going to be launching our Brown Girl Bosses um, kind of campaign highlighting these strong Indo-Caribbean female leaders in our community. Um, so um, I guess like, you know, the reason why um, I'm so excited today is um, I was born in Trinidad. Uh, we moved here. Um, me and my Okay. Having a little 
difficulty with connection. Uh, I so think I did come grow back. up in with such a rooted Caribbean experience because of my parents. Oh. Can you hear me now? Better? One sec. A little bit, it's a little bit glitchy, but, um, but yes, keep, keep going. Uh, I think someone has to unmute you. Hold on. There we go. Yes. All Is, right. Can you hear me? Every, oh, awesome. Yes. Um, so yes, I was, even though I was born in Trinidad, um, I'm a first generation um, Canadian. And growing up in Canada, I still feel very rooted to um, that training experience because of my parents. Um, and within that, like they did bring a lot of, um, you know, their experiences and how they um, perceive their own identities into me and my brother's experiences as well. So a very multiculturally diverse area. Um, so it's just, you know, it's so great to be able to uncover like some of the implicit biases that we may have um, as Indo-Caribbean um, children um, and being kind of brought up that way because, you know, this is what our parents might have known all of their lives. So um, so good to kind of uncover those stigma stigmas and um, just, you know, be able to talk about it. It's the most important thing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and just um, on a personal note, you know, I... Um, uh, was married to uh, a black man, has a heritage from Jamaica. My children are mixed. I had these comments from mostly my grandma and some older aunties. Uh, the uncles wouldn't say anything, but some of the older aunties saying, well, good thing she, she got the lighter skin. So now we're talking of colorisms. Good thing she has the good hair. She got the good hair. So yeah. she has curls, but not kinks. Um, good thing my son got the good hair because his hair is completely straight like mine. In fact, we have the same haircut. <laughs> So these comments um, is, are things that I would hear that I never had the nerve to say anything because you're afraid you're gonna get licks. You're afraid of disrespecting your elders. You're afraid um, of the family maybe shutting you out. You're afraid of aunties never talking to you again. So these are the, the conversations that I think finally we have to have. We have to just start bringing them up in our house and we're gonna get and give you those um, resources and the tools to do that. But let's talk about history because many of our panelists had brought up why this even exists in the Caribbean culture and has uh, persisted and it's, it's here today in 2020. So I'm gonna go to Atika, uh, our historian, give us the history 101. I know that could be a whole seven month long session, right Atika, but we're, we're gonna uh, have you give us um, the brief history of how this all came about, this tension. Thanks, Natasha. So like Natasha said, um, bear in mind that there is a whole lot of history and a whole lot of nuance in, in the Caribbean uh, with each country and sometimes each region having its own history. So I'm going to be very general and then if there are specifics, we can raise them later. Um, at, because we started with the land acknowledgement, it's important to, to remember that the, the first peoples in the Caribbean were also indigenous peoples. Um, I mean, for the most part, Caribbean history is taught with that acknowledgement, which is great. Uh, but there are implicit biases within those, um, those histories themselves. Uh, I mean, if you've ever read anything about the Caribs uh, in, in the Caribbean, you'll know that the, the understanding of the indigenous populations in the Caribbean were heavily tainted by what was later told by European colonizers. So we've got the Tainos and the, the, uh, and the Caribs who landed in the Caribbean much earlier, we don't know how early, I mean, there are some records of uh, uh, people in Trinidad as early as 4000 BC. So we don't know when the, uh, the Caribs and the, uh, the Tainos actually arrived or any other indigenous populations. We just know that there were waves of populations prior to Christopher Columbus and that period of colonization that began later. Um, but then once we jump to about the 15th century, we've got European colonizers who arrive in the Caribbean. They actually initially uh, tried to enslave the Aboriginal population who was already there. Uh, to some extent, they participated in uh, cultivation. Um, it didn't go very well, as many of us know. And that is when uh, colonizers looked elsewhere for labor. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm really generalizing a very complex uh, process. So bear that in mind, because otherwise we might be here for the rest of the month. But uh, 
the once they've colonized uh, the land and start to establish plantations, this is where the entire Caribbean shifts, right? We are looking at uh, sugar, the term sugar became king, didn't come out of nowhere. It, uh, sugar really became, became king in parts of the Caribbean, especially Trinidad and Guyana, which we are focusing on today. And so um, once, uh, once this period you know, continued onwards, slavery and the enslavement of the African peoples, we're looking at the migration of about 3.1 million Africans to the Caribbean in the transatlantic slave trade. And on top of that, shortly, I, I want to, shortly is not actually the right word, but 200 years later, you've got the arrival of um, about 450,000 East Indians to the Caribbean. And, uh, and, and this, these processes of mass migrations of people disrupted the entire setting of the Caribbean. There were uh, the Aboriginals who were already there, many of them died of diseases, or at least that is the story. But I mean, historians and archaeologists, archaeologists raise questions about where, how they disappeared, because we know that the treatment of the enslaved Africans led to many, many deaths. Their migration processes were filled with horrors, and then the actual process of enslavement on the, pop, on the plantations were filled with horrors. Um, and then the arrival of the East Indian population then led to a, a very um, complex process that saw divisions developing in the Caribbean. And these are the divisions that we are all here to discuss today. So I just want to touch a little bit on how these, you know, the different ways that these divisions um, arose. Uh, the, the first one was geographic, right? We had a lot of the ex-slave population who were, um, you know, encouraged into apprenticeship between 1834 and 1838, realized that they were not going to, um, to see freedom in the way that they had hoped to see freedom. And so they avoided the plantations and found other forms of work and income. And so they, we had ex-slaves leaving the, pop, the plantations very quickly and creating small villages, what we call shanty towns um, in Guyana. And then uh, on, along the plantations, we saw the arrival of the Indo, um, the, Indi the East Indians at this, at this point who were, you know, setting up logies that were very closely connected. So we saw the formation of very, very close-knit communities uh, around these plantations. This was where they received health care. This was where they, you know, formed, this was their social life. This was what they knew. And so very, very strong identities started to develop in light of these geographic divisions. On top of that, you have stereotypes, right? Uh, we had, you know, um, within colonial documents, you see words like the lazy, um, the lazy black man, or you see stereotypes like the docile East Indian, uh, or the hardworking East Indian, or the superstitious African. And so you see all sorts of these stereotypes manifesting all throughout the Caribbean, right? They become part of policy. They become part of the way that people interacted with each other. So these stereotypes that came from the top then became part of our popular languages. So our newspapers then started to regurgitate things where people would call each other out for engaging in interracial dialogue, for participating on a plantation, you know, for being a black person and working on a plantation, because that's supposed to be an Indo-Caribbean uh, job. And so these stereotypes, uh, were pervasive. And as we know, these stereotypes often did not leave. Um, on top of the geographic separation and these stereotypes that were building in the Caribbean, we saw um, economic pressures, right? Um, like I mentioned, sugar was king, but that's really simplifying the, the horrors that indentured uh, laborers experienced. And in many cases, historians have called indentured laborers um, enslaved peoples because of the similarities between their experiences as laborers and the experience of the enslaved Africans in the Caribbean. Um, and then the, the last part of this, and we can get back to some of these later, is the, um, the formation of politics that came out of these separations. So we saw, for example, the development of political groups through individuals who led these, these same uh, ethnic organizations. We, um, you know, someone once said to me on an interview, um, it, it, an elder Guyanese, 
everybody dabble in politics. The initial response when you ask people, what have you done in terms of political engagement is, oh, well, nothing. But everybody talked politics. It was the language of the street. It was the language of sports. It was, it was you know, in jibes between men. It was, it was at the corner shop. So um, in many ways, these popular languages took in the language of, of enslavement and of indentureship and regurgitated the stereotypes that were experienced at that point because, and, and I, 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 I'm simplifying it, but we have to recognize that this is intergenerational trauma, right? The horrors of these experiences are, are things that people develop different identities to, to cope with these experiences. And a lot of these identities were social. They were the ethnic groups. It was the religious groups. It was going to the mandir with your friends. It was hanging out at the mosque. It was sharing celebrations, right? Many, many people um, would attend, people of different faiths would attend each other's weddings and things like that. It was a very community-centered um, understanding of life. And it still, in many ways, can be. And so these are the places, the spaces that perpetuated these stereotypes in order to protect themselves. And so that, while, while that's not a justification for how things um, continued, it's important to understand that this is the context within which elders are, are speaking. This, this is the context from which they understand their histories and from where they, they are then regurgitating these stereotypes. Um, I mean, I can go on much longer, but we can come back to some of these pieces at a later time as well. Right. No, thank you. These um, spaces is what has led to this learning that we are trying to get people to now unlearn. And I'm sure it has perpetuated all sort of a whole array or a whole spectrum of racism and anti-Black uh, sentiments. So I'm going to go to Amala because I want you to talk about the spectrum of racism. Uh, a lot of people say, well, like, I can't be racist. I'm brown. So please, please explain this to us. Oh, someone needs to unmute Amala. I'm not in charge of the mics. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay. I think it's just, it's a Zoom thing. It's okay. We're, we're working through. So thank <laughs> you, Atika, for, for all of that context. And I think um, it's very, very important for us to keep in mind as we move forward with this conversation that part of that colonization process, as was already stated, is that idea of divide and conquer. So a lot of um, a lot of Indo-Caribbean and South Asian people included in that um, buy into this idea of the model minority myth, meaning, um, especially in the context of immigration, we made it, why can't you, right? Um, and we also buy into the myth that, as Natasha already said, only white people can be racist, right? We're, we're brown, we're considered people of color, so we can't be racist. But what we need to recognize is that racism happens at different levels. So Atika already alluded to the kind of, you know, the stereotypical, the, the banter, the prejudice, um, treating someone differently because of the way they look, using a racial slur, all of that happens between personal. So we can call that personal or interpersonal racism. But really, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And so what happens or what creates a problem in this conversation is we view that as isolated events on an individual level, and we don't take into account how deeply they are connected to what Atika already alluded to, which is cultural, institutional, and structural racism. So if you wanna read about this further, these are not my own ideas, so as much as I like to take credit for things. Um, so this is called the PCS model, Personal Cultural Structural Model. Um, of, of racism. And so cultural, if we think to things like, how does the media represent black people or blackness? And how does that contribute to anti-black racism? And if we just look specifically at recent, how, how recent news reports um, portray the Black Lives Matter protests versus the protests from a few weeks ago, or, or maybe it was about a month ago, where predominantly white people were fighting to end lockdown. Right. So at a cultural level, what is the media um, showing us? Right. What are we being socialized to believe? Um, and then at an institutional or structural level. And now there are some um, nuances here. So first I'll say structural racism is a system in which public policies, institutional practices and other norms work in various 
reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. So it, um, it specifically acknowledges that there are these vast histories at play, right? The history of colonization of the transatlantic slave trade that reinforce those cultural representations of blackness as inferior and those interpersonal statements or comments or beliefs um, that, that uh, serve to enact anti-black racism at a personal level. So structural racism is not something that um, a few people or, or some institutions kind of choose to practice. It's really, it's a feature of our social, our economic, and our political systems that we all exist in. So when we talk about having this conversation and we talk about how we're all implicated in this, it's because of the systemic racism that exists, right? So I'll just give you some examples because sometimes I find that um, that really helps to kind of contextualize this conversation. So if we're speaking specifically about institutional racism, that refers to policies and practices within institutions. So things like the legal systems, our criminal justice system, education, healthcare, um, that either by intention uh, and by design explicit or through these implicit and subconscious biases produce outcomes that chronically favor um, whiteness or white people and put a specific racial group specific Specifically, black people at a disadvantage. So think, for example, just about, and I'm sure Natasha can talk us through like some uh, recent news stories, but just think recently about the examples of institutional racism in school disciplinary policies, right? In which students of color, and again, specifically black students, are punished at much higher rates than their white counterparts for the same behavior, right? Or the criminal justice system. And there's, there's, um, What's great about this movement now taking foot is that a lot of these nuances um, are coming to light. We're, we're moving beyond a sort of either this or that kind of understanding of racism. And we're starting to talk about the nuance. And there's a really, really great thread by one of the writers of Grey's Anatomy. And she talks about all of the things that she did, all of the crimes that she committed as a young adult and she was never charged, never tried, never even handcuffed. And she talks about stealing, about um, drunkenly assaulting someone, driving while intoxicated. These are things that um, uh, Black folks have been um, targeted by police for, right? And, and murdered for, right? So when we talk about the systemic racism, that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about, right? Um, and I, and I have plenty of examples, plenty of examples specific to the Canadian context, because I think that's another sort of um, aspect to this conversation is that um, as brown people or people of color, we like to think we're exempt from this conversation. And also as Canadians, we like to think that, you know, it's, it's that that's a, an American problem. That's something that we don't have to deal with. Right. Um, but a lot of people are kind of um, telling, telling on that. Uh, uh, the different policies and practices that happen in the RCMP, in our um, provincial police forces, in our criminal justice systems. Um, uh, you know, again, the, 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 the numbers are there, right? The research is there and we see how disproportionately um, Black folks are represented in every system that serves to diminish their life in, in very real ways. Uh, it's a lot to try to explain that to your 90 year old grandma who's just going to say that is just how it is, you know, <laughs> this is, so this is where we're going next, right? So we're going to first talk about some of the experiences because, um, I, first of all, I know a lot of people have just joined us in the last uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes. So a reminder, if all of our uh, listeners and our viewers can just mute their mic and, um, take off your video and then we can focus on the panelists, which is great. But we want to uh, get right into two main questions that we're going to go into. We want to know, hear some personal experiences um, and also get into why everybody's here, right? Okay, what do I do now? I want to talk to my, my, my mom or my grandma. So, um, Joan, I'm going to come to you first. Um, Joan was raised, for those of you who, who missed the beginning, Jane, jo Joan was raised in Trinidad. So talk to me about uh, what that experience was like. Uh, any race, racist and prejudicial experiences that you had um, between the, the two groups and directed towards you specifically? 
Oh, and did we just lose Joan? Uh oh, did we just lose Joan? We can come back to Joan. We might go to Sita first then while Joan comes back on. Okay, we'll go to Sita. So Sita, same question. Uh, what did um, anti-blackness look like growing up in your house? What kind of things did you hear in your community or within your family growing up? Well, I, I would um, actually like to um, speak to the question of um, structural racism because that's how it got manifested in my life on a personal basis. There are two observations that I will make. Uh, one is a reference has already been made to the uh, impact of the transatlantic slave trade, which meant that uh, for the African community, people of African origins, they uh, would not have had the same access to resources as say, the uh, South Asian community, which who would have come for, as indentured laborers. So they got a little bit of money. At the end of it, some did, some didn't at the end of their period and so on. So fast forward to when I was growing up. Um, the, when I speak to the issue of structural racism, I, I want to look at how the schools were organized and how the churches were organized so that the elementary school that I went to was run by Canadian missionaries and most of the kids who were in my school were uh, of Indian origin. Whereas the Anglican church and the Catholic church, their schools were mainly filled with children of African origin. So that from the beginning, uh, there was a split in, how, in your social interactions. That did not carry on into um, high school where there was certainly a mixed, um, there was more mixing and there was a bit more diversity in the schools. Even though the school that I went to was run by, say the, uh, what would be the equivalent of the uh, United Church, the Canadian Mission Schools, they were called back then. There was certainly a number of people of African origin. So that your ability to interact with people who were not of your same background would have been limited by those structural uh, situations uh, that were in place. I don't totally know why the church missionaries made the decisions that they did about which communities they would work with. I'm sure if I asked my mother, she would, she would tell me. Uh, I did not have those sorts of anti-Black experiences in my family because my parents were both very generous and outward looking. And we certainly had friends and people who worked with us who were, you know, who were of African origin. So I didn't have that experience. There's one other observation that I want to make about my own personal experience is that going to school in the Caribbean, to high school at any rate, because I finished uh, uh, you know, O-levels in Trinidad, was that I actually had teachers who were you know, South Asian, who were Black, who were, you know, and Trinidad is a very diverse uh, country, so I also had teachers who were white, they were white Trinidadians, teachers who were of Spanish background. So I had that experience, whereas kids who are growing up today in Canada, people, children who are African, who are South Asian, they don't have the same exposure to diverse teachers. Uh, and I think that, you know, so that, so that my personal experience is I think a little bit different from what many kids are growing, are finding growing up today. So, you know, I'm not, you know, and, and I know that there have been times when various relatives in our family have married uh, Africans, people of African origins, and there would be great consternation by their family members and I do remember my mother in particular wading in to those conversations to really just sort of, you know, call a halt to that kind of feeling. 
And I know it's also happened here where some other relatives were, you know, marrying people off, you know, right? to great consternation of their parents. And I don't do know that my parents, well, my father died a long time ago, but certainly my mother played a, an important leadership role in terms of saying to the parents of those young people, just chill, <laughs> you know, this is fine, you know, and so on. So that, um, you, you know, so we do actually have to look at some of those structural patterns, those social institutions, and how they've also helped form the attitudes and values that say your grandmother, as some grandmothers and some old aunties and uncles would, would have. So, you know, that's one of my contributions to, to this, con this these particular topics. And maybe Joan has reappeared. I, I do have one other observation to make, and that was that the necklace that Racky was wearing has a map of Trinidad on it. Okay, sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Yes, she does have that necklace. My mom has the same necklace, the exact same necklace, exactly. Um, thank you, Sita, for sharing your experience. I, I want to ask Joan the same thing. Just talk a bit about your, your growing up and um, any of the, the tensions that existed between the two communities. Okay. Um, first, I want to go back to a bit of what um, Atika was talking about earlier in terms of the arrival of the indentured laborers and the African slaves. East Indians were brought in as the indentured laborers, as we all know, usually for a period of five years. They did not come in as slaves. The agreement was that after five years, they were given the option to return to India or stay and given a grant of land. That was the agreement with the indentured laborers. Whereas with the Africans, they were slaves, period, and they had nothing to go back to or to acquire after slavery was abolished in the mid 1800s. So there's a big difference between the two. And on top of that, the East Indians that came to Trinidad, I can only speak to those who came to Trinidad, that came to Trinidad, they came from a caste system in India. And they were more, or let's say if you had five levels, maybe that group came at the fourth level to Trinidad. But when they came and met with the Africans, they considered themselves better than the Africans because they did not come as slaves. And that's where the British are the ones continue the divide and conquer mentality and encouraged it among the two groups. So they remain with that division of one better than the other. And of course, with the fact that the Indians had the land and they cultivated the land, they got into agriculture, the Africans didn't want the land because the land represented to them slavery. So they didn't want any part of the land whatsoever because that to them was slavery. That's where they came from. So they tried their best to get away from it. And most of them went into like the oil field, laboring field and grew up in that area. That's, that's the, the difference that the two groups had. I mean, for me, I grew up in the South and surrounded by Indians. I had friends right through school, no problems, enjoying the, 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 their celebrations, the Hindu celebrations, the Muslim celebrations. I enjoyed the food, look forward to my sawine. I knew where to go and get it. Like I grew up with that. And they were all around me and we were all friends. I'll tell you when it changed for me. I had, I end up with an Indian, East Indian boyfriend by the name of Lal. And my family accepted him. In our household, like Sita was saying, that was not a conversation of who is better than who. We're all people. 
we all individual. And my parents, my dad in particular, helped everybody. He was that person in the village who helped everyone. And Lal was accepted, came to the house. We are always had him for dinner, had him for whatever, had a great time. He could not take me to his home. I could not go to his family at all. I only saw pictures of his parents and pictures of his sisters and brothers, never met them. Eventually he left Trinidad, went to Jamaica to study. He's a doctor in Jamaica. We still keep in touch today and talk about our families and stuff. But that was the only reality check I had growing up and feeling the, the, the separation of the two groups. Other than so, that, I didn't. So Joan, you didn't um, take that uh, forward in your life, right? You didn't say, well, this is the way it is and I'm never going to date um, someone who is no. Indian again because... So what is it in you that made, made you say, no, 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 this is wrong, but I'm, I, I, you can't speak up about it because you can't speak to his parents, but did you have the conversation with him at the time? Well, we had the conversation and he just said, that there's nothing I can do about it. You know, he just right. said, nothing I can do about it. But because I was surrounded with all the different groups, remember in Trinidad, we had people in every group as leaders. We had Indians, we had Blacks, we had, we had everything. So to us, that's why when I came to this country and people talk about multiculturalism, I said I lived it all my life. I have been into it all my life and I accept each person as an individual because that's how my father brought us up, right. to accept people as individuals. I'll tell you one reason why I cook so much and I bake so much, my dad every Christmas made bread and went to every home that could not get what they would like to enjoy Christmas, he delivered to them. And as children, we were in the car going into the homes, giving it to people. So I grew up just helping anyone and everyone. So even that happened to me with, with Lal, that it didn't, it didn't, I said, okay, that's it. And I press on. I, if I met another Indian guy, I wouldn't even think twice. <laughs> <laughs> I might do it again, but... It just didn't turn out that way. I came to Canada after that. Right, right. So, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, Butterfly. So we're going to go, this is the um, sort of opposite, right? So uh, Butterfly, talk to me about um, your dating experiences and what happened within your household. And, and sorry, um, we need Butterfly's mic. Um, there we go. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so I've been on my own since I was 14. Um, uh, and I didn't have my first son at 14. I had him at 18. So growing up, I heard, I heard stories. I heard stories of um, beatdowns. I heard stories of being jumped. I've heard stories of burning homes. I heard stories of rapes and pillaging. So I heard these stories and I, I felt their pain. I was young, so you don't, you don't push any further. You, you carry the stories that are given to you. Um, you know the saying, I'm I, I's a Guyanese, okay? I's a Guyanese, okay? You've heard the saying, you made your bed, now you must lie in it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when I left home, that's what my mother said. Okay. And that's, that's at this time, my parents are also not together. So that, 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 there's no going back. You know, like at 14, I'm also wrong and strong, maybe a little bit, but my mom's also a very strong woman. So when she said that, I knew this ain't going to happen. So I had my son at 18, right? Right. And, and he's a black boy. And that just reaffirmed all the stories I heard as a child. So even if there was that opportunity, I'm not going to, especially when I know the hurt. Now I'm not talking about structural racism. I'm not talking about the analysis and the theory of it, okay? I'm talking about Guyanese people who are, you know, poor people, working people, who are just trying to get a better life. You know, they come to this country, they lay some roots 
And then what happens is like the family ends up competing with each other, you know, a bigger car, a bigger house, right? Right, our own family do that, right? So I think at a young age, I just knew. Yeah, I just knew. My mom and I still don't talk to this day. Right. Okay. Okay. And so, so, right. So I live in Jane and Finch, right. And Jane and Finch is, um, a community that is, um, intergenerational of, immig- of, of, of West Indian Caribbean, um, Latin community, right. From the eighties. Right. So this is historic. Then you also have a community that's immigrants, uh, newcomers, refugees, This is a community of folks with no status, undocumented. So when we talk about structural racism, on a mainstream way, one million percent. But when we talk about structural racism, right, we're talking about 100 percent. Black bodies are impacted the most. But when you're talking about communities like Jane and Finch, where it's racialized, black, brown, newcomers, right? We're talking about very vulnerable communities that make up a whole community. I'm talking about a community that had, that has, you know, at any given time, over 200 temporary temp agencies, right? So precarious work, hard labor, you can die on your job. Two, two, three, like workers have died on their job right in this neighborhood from Fair Foods. So when it comes to on the block, right? When I, I work at Sheridan Mall, when I go outside, I see Vinci, I see, I see Lucian, I see, I see Guyanese, I see, right? And they're all parked up. They're all playing their vibe. They're all taking their drink, their drink, right? They're all lashing domino or doing their thing, right? When the police come on the block, everyone's getting sweet, right? So I think, I think, I think what's happening on the ground, I'm not saying there's 100% solidarity and camaraderie, right? But I think in generations, people have each other's back, right? So I think there's some dichotomies at play here when we talk about survival in Toronto, right? This neighborhood's right now COVID hotspot, right? So, so I think, I, th- I think that's what I want to say about, about that and the nuances with that. And me living in a neighborhood that I've lived in for over 25 years, I'm butterfly, I'm Z's mom. I'm not saying we don't see race, but what I'm saying is when we identify to lived experience, crappy housing, teachers kicking out, kicking our kids out of school, parents are getting calls from the teacher, your, your children have problems, right? It, it's coming across the board if, if English is a second language, if, if, if there's a criminality to poverty as well, right? So I, I feel like this needs to also be a part of the conversation. As a member of Jane and Finch Action Against Poverty, um, this is a group, uh, anti-poverty action group that we, we've been around for 12 years in the neighborhood. And um, our neighborhood has um, a huge population of Guyanese folks in our neighborhood. And our membership of, of tanties and aunties are, are Guyanese. And when we talk about police and schools, and when we talk about housing, and when we talk about precarious work, And when we talk about TTC was five cents when I came into the country and now I can't afford it and I paid my dues, right? And it's taken 12 years for us to build these relationships. So JFAP just doesn't have one meeting a month, right? Where it's this big meeting and that's what everybody sees. We work with community residents and and we have these conversations. Uh, And and we talk about these uncomfortable um, realities. And the realities don't just start in Jane and Finch because when we talk about our stories, they cross oceans and continents. And and when we build trust and relationships, 
we're able to talk about these issues and realities in real ways. So the first time I talked about being <clears throat> a brown woman with a black son in JFAP, that was a hard conversation. But they loved me. And we talked about it. And we were able to see past, you know, some of the traumas that people ex experienced back home and might not have had the time or the opportunity to learn about structural racism and, and divide and conquer and, 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 you know, the design of the, you know, mm -hmm. after hour, right? So I think, first of all, I never think it's too late to have those conversations, but we have to create those spaces that we create safety, we build trust, that we see each other as, as people in the struggle together and, and to have those hard conversations. Mm -hmm. Because I know those aunties thought about maybe how they talk to their daughter or how they thought about somebody that they worked with and you know, they play nice with that work and had their thoughts about at home, mm -hmm. right? It, it was an opportunity for us to, rep and it's ongoing, it's ongoing. It, it's painful. I'm holding back the tears, but it's also beautiful. And, yeah. and, and I'm grateful commu for communities like Jane and Finch, where in the struggle, we have each other. And, and we've, we've got to figure it out. And it's not perfect. <laughs> um, but it's real. Mm. Yeah, right. Uh, you know what, Amala, this, this is a Amala moment because even based on Joan's experience and Butterfly, we can tell that you have so much pain and you are holding back tears. What happens to somebody when they love somebody and their parents don't, right? Because you, your parents are supposed to love you unconditionally. You love somebody, but the two don't love each other. So what kind of trauma does that create on somebody? Yeah, I think, I think it, it absolutely has been identified, the idea of intergenerational trauma, right? Um, and that sometimes this manifests itself in sort of very nefarious ways in terms of our family dynamics. Um, and in terms of, you know, colloquially, we kind of call it um, oppression Olympics, right? Well, they have it bad, but we had it just as bad. Or like, I didn't have it easy, so what are you, t what are you trying to tell me, right? And I think that, um, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just mindful of time here that we're already at the, uh, at the one hour mark, right? Um, so some, some key points that have been identified is the idea of intersection right? Which is that we all have identities where we hold some degree of power and privilege and all have identities where we might be um, oppressed or experience, um, uh, you know, um, well, oppression, right? Um, so Butterfly identified the idea of income as uh, intersecting with race and as intersecting with status, right? Uh, uh, by status, I mean your status in Canada. Are, are you, you know, a migrant worker? Right now we're seeing so much with migrant workers, many of whom come from the islands, right? Um, and, and the treatment during, during COVID, during the pandemic. So really this... this um, uh, kind of spans, if you think about sort of a web where there are uh, kind of fingers everywhere, right? Um, I just, I wanted to throw it back to Atika for a moment because um, I, I believe it was, uh, Joan, I could be mistaken, but there was a specific mention of, um, or perhaps it was you, Butterfly, I apologize, where you specifically mentioned, um, you know, your, your parents or that, um, that kind of messaging from your mom or your family about specific incidents, right, that you hear about um, the killings, you hear about the rapes or so-and-so's home or um, this riot or, or that sort of interaction between Afro-Caribbean and Indo-Caribbean that sort of cements this view of different for instance, separate, separateness. Um, so Atika, maybe if you can shed some light on that historical context a little bit more with some of those um, specific examples. There are two parts um, that I wanted to draw out of that. Um, and I think that bringing these conversations back to the historical context really makes us see how we're replicating cycles. Um, and, and there are two things from that. I mean, 
uh, David Trotman, who's an incredible Toronto historian, has written about crime in Trinidad. And he says that, um, you know, the practice of liming, for example, or lounging outside was criminalized through co colonial law first. And then when we adopted democratic systems led by people from the Caribbean, non-Europeans, we adopted these principles within our law. So we continue to criminalize uh, lounging or liming, right? And then these became associated with people who lacked respectability. And this is the second angle that I wanted to draw on, that a lot of our understanding of race and class is rooted in 19th century Victorian ideas of respectability. The way you dress, the way you look, the way you speak, the way you hang out, the way you eat, all of this, right? And so um, I, I just, I, I wanted to point to those things to say that we, we keep replicating these systems of violence in our own ways and without realizing that we are repeating cycles of violence that are rooted in the very same oppression that we are hoping to get rid of. Um, so I wanted to point to that and also to say to Butterfly that um, when I moved to Canada, I actually lived in Jane and Finch. So I feel you and I really appreciate the work you're doing there. Thing. That's amazing. I, I do want to, um, because as you guys have all been talking, little chats are popping up in the upper right of my screen and people are saying, you know, oh, I, I talked to my mom and they always throw it back to, well, we did it, so why can't they? So I, I'm going to go to Rocky now because I want to go into question two. What kind of conversations have you or your siblings or any other family members tried to have with the older members of your family when things came up and say, you know, what are we seeing in the news? What about the protests? What about Black Lives Matter? Have you tried to have any of these conversations with um, some of the older people in your home? Uh, for sure. So um, definitely with um, what's happening right now um, in the States brought up um, having these important conversations. Um, so it, it, it is a bit trying, I will say, to have these conversations with the older generation, um, but it's important to, you know, still have them, still, you know, engage in ways that, um, ways where, you know, where they would listen or bring up um, different um, contexts that they, it might be easier to understand, um, you know, maybe in like the context of what happened back home, for example. So, um, yes, definitely um, these conversations, you know, are happening and I'm really glad for that because you know it's important to unlearn all of these biases that you know we implicitly have that I may implicitly have growing up um, in an Indo-Caribbean household with a majority of an Indo-Caribbean network so um, um, yeah I do I do notice in my family um, especially uh, that there is that divide there is that um, kind of tension as well when it comes to talking about the Black community and uh, their struggle. And there is that kind of, I want to say, a nuanced colonial kind of, kind of thing where it's like, well, you know, it, it, it's, you make your bed, you lie. And that's it, really not necessarily so because it's a system set up against you. Um, so that's kind of like, you know, where I am in my household. It's an ongoing journey, um, to, but it's important to just keep on having them. Um, so, um, it's, yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now. We, we do have to keep having them, but Amala, so Rocky says she, she would bring it up, but not much progress. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how do we actually start that conversation? Do we go in with like a big old history lesson and say, <laughs> you know, this is why you're feeling the way you're feeling, or do we go in with something light and easy? It's gotta be digestible. Right? right. And you don't want to feel, they don't want to feel like you're attacking them or, or you have a degree or oh, you have your degree in university. Yeah. <laughs> so you think you're better than me. Yeah. You know, Cause we get that as well. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, or, or the idea, you know, I went to the university of life, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a favorite one. Um, so I actually, I have a number of tips um, and, and sort of things for us to think about. And so maybe what I can do um, right now, given our time, is that I can start to go through them. And um, mm -hmm. I, can, I can try and keep up with the chat as they come in, or maybe Natasha, you can kind of 
cue, cue me um, sure. about the questions. Um, I see a question, um, how do we have this conversation without erasing their trauma or racism they face from the Black community? And I actually wanted to start there. Okay. So when we have intergenerational con conversations, one of the things that we need to know, uh, one of the kind of psychological facts we need to keep in mind is the idea of cognitive rigidity. What that means is basically a fancy way of saying hard A's. <laughs> um, <laughs> a kind of commitment to thinking a certain way with, uh, as we increase in age, the older we get, the harder it is to, for us to have that flexibility in our understanding. This does not mean that it's a lost cause. Let me be very clear about that. This doesn't mean that these conversations are all worthless. It just means that we have to go in knowing that this is gonna take time, right? And it's hard to keep this in mind for us, especially when these conversations feel so urgent, right? Especially what's happening now with, the, with violence and, um, and death of, uh, you know, like, many of us who have black children or black partners, right? That this is, it's frightening and it feels urgent, but patience is our job as Indo-Caribbean people. Um, one of the things that black activists are calling for is for people to collect their own community, right? So it is not um, the labor of, of black folks especially for us in relation with Black people, it is not on them to be having these conversations. So it's on us to have that patience, that understanding, and that empathy. So when, it, when it's asked, how do we have this conversation without erasing their trauma, we start with empathy, right? And, and what empathy means is understanding and perspective taking. So in order to affect deep change, not just, oh, you know, you can't say that anymore right? We're talking about deep change and understanding. We need to start with understanding where our parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles are coming from. Again, this can be really, really hard to do, especially when things seem really kind of like painfully obvious to us, right? Um, but as Atika called our attention to these processes of colonization, enforced and, and maybe even built on a hierarchy, right? Because we know that there was the caste system before, but really enforced and embedded a racial hierarchy that placed whiteness at the top so that in order for um, our ancestors to be seen as valued, as worthy in order to move forward, proximity to whiteness was key. And so therefore they had to actively reject blackness. So really, when we think about interge intergenerational trauma, that is where that kind of embeds itself from the beginning, right? So when we start from that understanding, and when we have those conversations without moving to try and convince or educate, but just to learn and hear. So things like, when was the first time you remember hearing, uh, hearing that Black folks were not... Um, were lazy. When was the first time you remember uh, seeing Black people as a violent or believing that? What happened? What was it like for you? These preliminary conversations need to happen and not with us formulating responses in our mind at the same, at the same time to kind of rebut everything that is said, even though we might really, really want to. But we, people need to feel heard and validated from where they are sitting in order to even think about moving forward. And that's kind of um, therapy 101, right? That nobody really wants to change if they feel that they're being attacked, right? Again, it does not, because you're offering validation to someone, you're saying, I'm empathetic, I understand, I hear what you're saying. This does not mean that you agree, but it means that you understand why they might believe the things that they do. But and if it gets heated, Amala, when do you know, when do you walk away? Do you just walk away? Do you say, uh, what do you say in order to want to come back to the conversation? Later? Okay, so, so I think I'm having, I think I have some specific points to that. Um, and so, again, I want to talk specifically because we know West Indian people like, we like to get loud <laughs> as I sit here screaming at my computer screen. Um, and so, it can, again, it can be really, really hard to put our own emotions aside. And I'm not, um, I th I'm not advising anybody to throw your emotions away, but I'm saying that we need to understand the function of our emotions in a conversation. 
And so one thing we need to learn how to do is how to deal with our own discomfort, anger, and frustration. And one of the things that's tempting is to shut down, to give up, right? And again, uh, a learning for us from psychology is the fight, flight, freeze response, right? Um, and that we can go into a whole psych 101 kind of lecture. I won't do that, but it's a typical response when we feel threatened. So it happens when we feel conflict in our relationships it, and it sets off an alarm and it actually triggers a physiological response. Our heart starts racing, our face gets red, maybe our hands shake or our palms get a little sweaty. And that is, on the one hand, it's a good thing because it amps up your system, it gives you energy. But on the other hand, it's really hard in these conversations because what it does is it also clouds your, clouds your mental state. So we don't have as much uh, capacity to engage in these kinds of difficult conversations when we're so activated, right? People don't, and this is true as much for us as it is for the people we're having a conversation with. People don't learn when they feel attacked. Um, any teacher can tell you that, uh, any educator can tell you that, that people do not take in knowledge when they themselves are feeling threatened, right? Because their alarm, their internal alarm bells are going off. So when we start from that place of doing our best to understand the context, already we're kind of creating um, a, a scenario where it might be more likely that they listen to us. And we have to remember, I'm not talking about in the span of one conversation, right? I'm talking about this is, you know, weeks and months and we talk about it one day and maybe we leave it for a week, right? Um, um, Amala, there's actually a question from um, Nicole Singh because you mentioned empathy. So how do we get, well, you talked about how to start the conversation and kind of go, go at it over weeks and weeks and months. So how do we get our parents to empathize with our Afro-Caribbean partners? So how do you get them to empathize? Yeah, and I think this is a really, really important question. Um, and I think it's something that we'll absolutely be covering in the subsequent webinars. So um, little plug for that. <laughs> right. <laughs> specifically about engaging with our partners and our children as well. Um, yeah. But this idea of creating empathy, when we, and this is another kind of uh, principle from education, a lot of people learn through modeling. So when we show empathy to, towards someone, it's a lot easier for them to show empathy towards us, right? So the, a strategy of perspective taking, this is a good term to Google if you're really interested in this, um, helps people and specifically people who have that more cognitively rigid that like it is like this but perspective taking helps people understand the world from another point of view so imagining themselves experiencing um anti-black racism we experience racism ourselves a lot of us so there's already some seeds of understanding there right um and things like it doesn't have to be through a one-on-one -on -one conversation or an argument or something like that. We can do a lot of this directly through things like um, documentaries, movies, books, articles, um, uh, short videos or clips. Um, exposure to different narratives and experiences creates empathy. When we understand people and see them as people, that creates empathy and that can be incredibly powerful. Right. This is a very long process. In fact, we you said it at the beginning, it's a lifelong commitment. Um, I want to go back to Butterfly for a second because she shared that she had a lot of pain, um, that her, her and her mom still don't talk to this day. I'm sure there was a lot behind that. But um, tell me about what that conversation was like with your parents, with your, um, your Afro-Caribbean partners. What led to the, you guys not talking? uh we just need a, a mic unmute for butterfly there we go there we go um uh, so so my mom and i have never um communicated since i left at 14 and when we have it, it um it, it was violent or um that's that's fine that's my mom and there's a lot of forgiveness and and understanding you know, she, she had her own struggles coming into this country, marrying young, having children young. 
Um, it, it, you know, it wasn't the healthiest relationship. Um, she, you know, three kids, three under nine. You, you have to forgive to move on. I think I think that's where that that's where we're at. Um, so my dad and I have an interesting relationship. <laughs> um, uh, I've always uh, connected with him while I was growing up, and um, uh, my first son's father and I we got together in in grade nine, grade ten, um, and I was already living in a group home, so I'm a big woman, right? So you can't tell me nothing. You want to kick me out? I got no problem. I take the 36 bus and go down St. Clair, no problem. So I think that shifted a little bit of the power. Um, my dad, you know, he had, he's in another relationship and that was partially, um, how my family probably snapped. And, you know, again, my dad has his own stuff, his own probably guilt. Um, so I think he walked lightly with me and, and being with a black man, um, we never had conversations. It was just always in his in his presence, in his home. So if you want to see me, I'm going to bring, I'm, I'm going to bring him with me. Um, and that took time for, for my partner at the time to get comfortable because he felt like he wasn't welcomed. He felt unsafe, <laughs> but he was also concerned about, about me as well. Um, so we had each other's back, I guess, in that way. Um, I don't know if, so, so my big son's 24. He's brilliant. He, he's brilliant. He's, he's compassionate. He's an artist. He, he's, <laughs> he's a talker. He creates, he loves, um, he's handsome. Um, when he comes into a room, he holds his own. That's your grandson. You know, that's part of your that's part of your tree and I'm your firstborn, and that's your first grandson. And you know how they love man, you know, boy pick me. Right. So I tried my best to be that boy child and, 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 and my dad loves me. <laughs> but there's, there's only so much I'm going to do the dance as well. Right. I'm, I'm going to protect my children. I don't care if he's 24. I, I, I've protected him from the beginning. When it gets too much, I'm ready to go. It's, it's nothing yeah. for me to, 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 to make that move and turn my back. Um, and I think, especially when I was younger, I, I might have had a chip on my shoulder too. Like, you know, none of you wanted to take me in when I was in a group home. I was a bad breed child, you know, like, so, I don't think we've had those healthy conversations. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's acceptance and, and there's authentic love. My dad loves my firstborn child. He loves him. Um, and I believe that, but I feel like I have protected both of them. Both of them. I, I don't want my first child to experience you know, there's times where I've had to check them, right? And, you know, I'm young, I don't have the tools or the language. So it, it could be, you know, it could be just as bad as they give it, right? So, right. Um, and, and that's what it is, you know, to protect your firstborn child. Um, so my dad doesn't live in this province. He, he lives in Winnipeg. Um, and, and we have a really strong relationship, more so now. <laughs> Um, and, and I, I've had a, another son, um, from another man who's also black and still I've never married. So, you know, I think the issues they have might be layered, but they also, they also can't snuff the accomplishments. Right. Well, I think you, you just hit it on the head right there. Right. Uh, so Atika, she just said it's, it's layered and it is our parents and our grandparents are remembering 
the racism from their years. So this is where we're talking about the intergenerational trauma, but how does that relate back to politics from back home? I, For Atika. Can I say something on that? Oh yes, Joan, absolutely. Yes, please. How it relates to politics back home? The political arena used the divide in Trinidad. Prior to Pandey getting involved in, as the prime minister in Trinidad way back when, we all function very well with each other. Racism could have been, yes, it's there, but it was buried in a, to a certain point. It was not in your face. Let's put it that way. It was not in your face. Politics came into the, into the, the whole thing with Pandey and suddenly you heard the, the statement, it's we time now. We never heard that before. Never heard it before. So you suddenly heard this, it's we time now. And what happened was a lot of things got changed in the government. They got rid of all the blacks and brought in all the Indians. And it really created a big divide that we didn't have for many, many years. In so much, I'm the first of 10 children. My one brother, one sister of mine, marry a brother, how do I put it? A brother and a sister marry a brother and sister, one on the black side and one on the, on the Indian side. So we had it on both sides, right? They had their children. One, one brother has a boy and a girl. The girl's very Indian looking and the boy very black looking. Although he's light skinned, he's still more on the black side. In school at age 10, the girl was playing with an Indian group of She's more Indian and she was playing with some Indian children. The brother is approaching to join them. And you know what they said? He can't come here. He's black. And she said, but that's my brother. I said, we don't care. He don't look like us. And she left. Because she started to cry and she felt hurt and she left. And that only came about after politics took over the change in Indian versus black. And then we saw it again, more so when um, Kamala took over again. So politics it kept playing a big role in Trinidad in dividing the Indians and the Blacks. I would say I agree. as well. Race politics. I, I'll leave Trinidad because if there's one thing <laughs> I won't do is mess with the memory of one of the elders. <laughs> they, yeah. they know their history. Um, but uh, in Guyana, the same thing happened, right? Um, as I was saying to Narosha yesterday, we forget that initially, uh, you know, the PPP and PNC, it was all the PPP. It was um, both Barnum and Jagan were together. We started, um, we received independence as, you know, a multiracial post-colonial state um, that began in the 1950s. And, um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, as soon as the state was elected, it was, uh, the British declared it because of fear of socialism, they declared it uh, to be a false election and paused it, retook control of the colonial state again. And, um, and by the time the state was, uh, by the time elections happened again in 1958, 59, it was, everything was put on, on hold. Burnham and Jagan had had differences and so race politics began at that point under the two umbrellas. And I mean, that, I, that's the, in a way I'm simplifying it because to be fair, those racial politics had their roots in colonial times. It didn't suddenly appear. Exactly. Uh, politics hold those roots to the poor, those racial politics to the forefront and did, you know, began an entire 50 plus years of racial politics as the determined <laughs> way to run the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Sita, your experience, you said, was very, very different because you said that your parents, you say that they didn't have these views, right? That they were very open. So you didn't have to have this conflict, conflicting talk with your parents. So what about grandparents or older generations when you were younger, when you were eight, nine, ten? Um, did you see siblings or, or others having these conversations? Your experience is very different. 
Uh, well, I didn't know my, you know, they were deceased. My parents, my dad got married when he was older and my mom was much younger. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I did certainly witness these things, but I, but I but I want to go back to something that Joan said earlier. I, I do. I, Joan uh, indicated that she thought politics, the split between uh, the the entry of race into politics, seemed to begin with Pande, but I actually think it belonged. It actually was there before. Uh, my, I left Trinidad, of course, in 1967. But I have a vivid memory, uh, or at least a memory, maybe I'm just re maybe I'm just uh, <laughs> not really thinking correctly. But I do recall that when Eric Williams was prime minister, and uh, his cabinet only had one person of South Asian origin in it, uh, and that was very much the, you know, there was evidence of, of racial splits, in my view, at that time, within the political structure. And I don't believe that there were very many South Asians or people of Indian heritage who would have been in government positions. So I think that that actually was there before Pandey. So your comment about our time has come was just a restating of feeling that people were excluded before from the political and the bureaucratic structure. I certainly have had cousins who said to me that, uh, who've indicated that they felt that they could only advance so far within the various organizations that they were in because they were Indian. And there were other people who were less qualified than they, that they had to train and who were appointed above them. So, you know, I, I've, 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 I've heard the disappointment, but also the notion that they, you know, that they felt that uh, it was there, but they weren't going to but because there weren't political activists, because so many of them came out of, um, I suppose, a more um, religious and faith upbringing, that you know that's where they spent their time. So right. I mean, it was very, um, you know, and and certainly I, you know, when I've gone back, because I do go back every few years, certainly. Um, there are a lot of there was a lot made of Kamala as a woman Indian leader taking over the government and the things that she was pushing for it. She was actually, I thought, quite competent. But the kind of um, I've actually heard more, you know, certainly uh, more discomfort around gay issues recently than I have over Indian black stuff. Because, you know, many of those islands are very homophobic. Right, that's, that's what we're saying. This is such a huge topic and so many things have led to this uh, tension within the groups over hundreds of years. So when we start talking about, you know, Rocky who's trying to talk to her parents and trying to think, all the conversations we've been having is trying to think like, why do they think this way? What is it? Why don't we feel this way? Why, you know, why can't they just think like us? Why can't they just accept everybody? And Rocky, you said that you talked to your parents. It, it just, did it just end? Like when you uh, approached them, what, what did the conversation sound like? What specifically? Um, so, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead, Rocky. Um, yeah, so um, those conversations definitely has not ended. Um, I will say though that, you know, those conversations are rooted in so much of that racial divide that happened back home because of politics, um, even kind of up until this day as well as going on back home. Um, so when you kind of have that understanding of the context, um, kind of what Atika was saying before about, you know, you have to know the history of it as well. And sometimes those things can be um, 
not con really conceptually like understood. So um, it's, it's kind of important to shed light on the history of kind of where it all started and kind of break it down to like, because of the history, this is why the politics had happened. And that's where the racial divides had happened. Because of that, these are the implicit biases that, you know, you were grown up, you were brought up having. Um, and then there, you know, us being um, a first generation Canadian, um, it's kind of what's been taught today, um, or sorry, when we we're growing up. So now um, just bring back to like, how do we deal with this? How do we navigate and unlearn all of these biases? Um, so it's having these conversations like we're having today to shed all of this light on like the um, systemic racism um, that I'm noticing and the histories of it and just like bring it all in um, that it's intergenerational trauma at hand that, um, you know, we're, we are exposed to racism ourselves, but we kind of have to um, just know that it needs to change. These conversations um, are the beginning of the progress uh, in order to kind of know that and have these conversations with our parents who, you know, were kind of stuck in their ways initially, you know. Yeah, absolutely. My grandma was in her 90s when she passed last year. And I remember growing up, I mean, I was I'm married to a black man for 19 years. We were together 19 years. She didn't speak to him for the first seven. Started speaking a little bit when we got married, only started speaking when those great grandchildren came, right? So there is something about the great grands that uh, started to break her a little bit. But every time that I would bring up uh, something about grand, you can't, grandma, you can't say that. So I already, I already see from this conversation, I was approaching it wrong. And Amala's going to tell me that's not how you start the conversation, Natasha, because she's going to get defensive. And her answer was always like, oh, well, I don't know. Because, but what I realized was she was, she, something, the cogs were turning in her head. She was kind of rethinking her past. Like, well, that's what I was told. That's what I was learned. That's what I was taught. Um, so, you know, I, I am cognizant of time. We're uh, over to 9-11 right now. So I am going to pass it to Amala for some closing advice and tips. And while Amala's talking, I encourage our viewers and our listeners to send in any questions that we can um, ask any of our panelists up until... <laughs> Blossom saying, crap, it's done already? Well, yes, but there's, there's going to be more conversation. But Amala, take it over uh, while some people are submitting questions, and then hopefully we'll have some time for a few questions. Sure. sure. Um, so, so I think, um, well, first of all, I don't want to give the impression that there, this is the way this conversation has to go, right? Ultimately, you know, you know your family. Sometimes you have people who are very hard A's in your family. And sometimes you have people who are more willing to listen or who are more uh, open to understanding. I think Butterfly made a really, really important point, which is something that I wanted to come to, which is where we draw the line, right? So, so Butterfly mentioned when it, come to, when it came to her, her sons, that's it. it you, you don't say anything about them. And if you do, okay, I, I'm happy to, you know, like Natasha said, not talk for seven years or something like that. And obviously that's not something, you know, we're West Indian, community is important, family is important. That's not something I want to encourage. But we also have to understand that for, to protect ourselves and particularly our uh, Black partners and our Black children, there are some things that are never acceptable. And so there's this idea of a difference between calling somebody out versus calling someone in. So what I was talking about before, about coming from a place of empathy, creating space to hear about, you know, what happened back home when, right? Um, that's the idea of calling in. So we're calling in when, um, when we can have a conversation in private, when we can, you know, set up a good kind of time, not, not necessarily set up, but approach things when we're not already aggravated, basically, right? Some of us are baseline aggravated, but that's another conversation. <laughs> Um, but calling in requires that patience, right? And I would even, now this is very social worky of me, but I would even say go so far as to do some role play or script writing. Think of what you want to say in advance, right? Think of what the responses might be from the people you're having these conversations with and how you'd navigate. I, again, I know that sounds really, really cheesy, 
But if you practice having these conversations, you'll actually be able to deal with your own discomfort and anger and frustration a lot more effectively. And then calling out, so that's kind of the in the moment, Gra granny, this is not acceptable, or you know, you, you can't use that word, right? And that's where we, we use our emotion to convey this is an important thing, right? But we're afraid the, we're afraid we're gonna get licks, you know. Yeah. So, so but you're saying <laughs> so, stand so you're stay saying stand out of existence. <laughs> Make sure there's nothing they can throw. Um, okay. and, and you know, I, I know that we actually I saw in the comments we actually had some young kids um, uh, in in our uh, list tuning in here and I want to say that yes while Caribbean and West Indian culture is very very um, there's a very big emphasis on respect and respect for your elders. That's kind of where I was coming at with the, the idea of going in with empathy and asking, what, what was it like for you, right? That curiosity actually elicits a lot more movement for change, but there is also a time and a place to draw that line. Right. Um, and I know uh, in the very beginning, Natasha, you had mentioned um, uh, some comments about, you know, who got the good hair and who didn't or it's OK because he's light and and those yeah. kinds of things. I saw I, I can't remember who it was, but I saw another comment there about that's the way Caribbean people communicate. Right. And there's this idea that Caribbean people are just blunt. That's just how we are. If, if oh, you, you gain some weight or how you skin like that or, you know, oh, all the boy, there's mm -hmm. I mean. <laughs> that's again that's a, a, another part of it but um there there comes a point for us and each of us there there is no universal i cannot tell you what this will be for you i cannot tell you what this will be like for your family but you have to determine for yourself what is the line where i'm not willing to to go past this what is the point at which i will take some of that control and shut the conversation down right mm. um and yeah i'm seeing i'm seeing the comments there and they you know you might get cuss out you might get some licks shady comments again one of the one of the um biggest calls to action from black activists for non-black people uh, so white people and non-black people of color is what are you willing to give up in order to affect change and at the very, very least, we need to be willing to give up our own comfort. So, okay, someone might say some, some mean things. People are literally dying in the street, right? For some of us have seen those videos, some of us refuse to engage. We can take some licks for that, verbal licks, hopefully nothing physical, you know? Yeah. Um, so again, what are, you, what are you willing to give up, right? You, we have to be willing to be a little uncomfortable and sometimes a lot uncomfortable. Yeah. So that's... There is, there is a question from Mel um, and it's uh, directed about my experience relating to my partner. Any anti-Black racism there? How did you confront, cope, deal with it? How did you engage these types of conversation with the elders in your family? Well, I just told you, um, I didn't. And because I didn't know how, I didn't think I could, I didn't um, know anyone else who has, you just don't do that. So um, this is also a learning experience for me as well. I'm coming on here as a meteorologist. I'm not coming on here as, as the expert. Okay, this is why we have this panel here together to hear uh, what it is that we can take away from this. So I have been handling it wrong myself by not saying anything. Um, and not saying it at the right time. So I think you're right, Amala, is, is when it happens is the time to say something if it's offensive, right? But then when you want to have a long-term conversation about change, and I, I, someone had said it's not our responsibility to change our parents. They have to take that on themselves. But it is our responsibility to try to help them to recognize it, I think, would you say? Yeah, yeah. And, and I, anyone, anyone can jump in here, by the way, just I'm not directing to anybody. Let's just have an open conversation. Anyone wants to, to, to jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, I think it, I think it becomes our responsibility when we invite um, black folks into our lives. And when we have black children, how, how can it not be our responsibility? Because those are the people who will be harmed more by those kinds of comments. So it's true that, that we cannot enforce change, but we need to actively 
support people in that journey and, and make it, make it mandatory, you know? And I don't mean like you mandate that your family sits with you watching this zoom. Although if you want to do that, go for it, but make it a necessary part of, um, and, and, you know, Someone might call this manipulative, that's okay, but grandkids are a powerful tool. You know, Butterfly and Natasha both already alluded to the fact that when, when kids is on the scene, it's a different conversation, right? And yeah. so when we're really clear about our boundaries, you cannot say this in front of my partner, to my child, to me. You're making it very clear where you stand right? And there's a lot of power in that. Um, again, I know that we're West Indian and, and it's really, really hard to, to have these conversations. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm seeing. Yeah, yeah. Ren says, if we think it's hard, think about how they might inflict that racism on Black people. Exactly. And like I said, right, like this is the call that Black activists are asking from us to collect our communities, right? Um, yeah, we were raised not to speak up. Can I ask you a question? It's Joan. Yes, can yeah. you ask? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is it is it good for us to deep go deep into the history when starting the conversation? Mm -hmm. Going to where it really started, no matter how far back you have to go. Isn't that a good place to start to help them to understand why? So, so this entirely is dependent on the type of audience you have. If you have someone who is not willing to listen or hear, and you're starting from, you can't use the N word, <laughs> yeah. right? Or you can't say this slur. That is very different than someone who is saying, oh, I didn't realize, or I didn't know, or I don't really understand why this stereotype is harmful right so I think really folks have to kind of understand um, who it is that you're trying to have these conversations with because I think absolutely the history is important um, and really does give us a very different perspective on um, like the different levels of racism like when we can understand the history we can understand how it is systemic and how it operates and continues to operate and how it resists things like, oh, well, if, um, you know, if black people would just work harder or, or, you know, get an education or stop doing this or stop doing that, stop running around in the street, whatever. Um, and, and I say these things readily because these are the things we hear. So yes, history is important and it needs to, these conversations need to be had when people are ready to have them. Cause someone with, I know. Yeah, so someone who's not going to hear it, it, it yeah, they're, they're not going to value it the way that we are in this conversation, you know? Got you. Now, I, I know that Almala has a lot of resources. Does anyone else have any, um, maybe a, a website or, or a, a video or a movie or a suggestion on ways we can get started? I know um, we were talking, I think, in one of our pre-chats before this with the panel, or at least with the organizers, with Ashley and Cindy, about Cindy. Cindy's the one who said, you know, her mom is not going to sit there through a whole history 101. She's just not. So this is where you have to understand your parents, right? So history is important, Joan, because they do have to know where this came from and understand the foundations. But sometimes it is a matter of a video or a book or something. So does anyone have any resources where we can direct? Because I, I see a lot of those questions coming up on how to, how to talk to our parents. Or even just to discuss the history first, maybe Atika, if there's sort of a um, more s simplified way because our parents may not sit there for an hour and a half about uh, history. This is Cedar here. They, uh, they like to tell their own histories. Um, I did a lot of oral interviews and it's, it's amazing um, what comes out in an interview. People will say things like, oh, well, I never did that. And then in the middle of the interview, they're like, oh, well, I did this. And then I will say, oh, but that was this. And they're like, oh, I guess I did do that, didn't I? Um, so start with their histories. Um, it doesn't have to be a history one-on-one -on -one lesson, but especially if they know you're recording it to you know, eventually play to their grandchildren, they're going to start to self-check themselves. They're going to start to say, oh, but I, I wasn't that racist. Don't, don't, don't put that in the record, right? 
So if you ask them their questions and you maybe say, okay, well, you know what, I'm going to record it just so I have it for me, they're going to start to self-check themselves without you pointing out their inconsistencies. Right. Sita, I think you had something. Yeah, I was, I was going to say that you really have to start with where that person is at and approach them in a way that's comfortable for them. And you can't embarrass people because they stop listening if you embarrass them. And I don't think you can call people, always call people out on the spot. Maybe it's a conversation you have later where you might say, I don't think you really, you know, you just say, do you mind if I have a conversation with you about what just happened or what happened yesterday? I think you have to choose your time um, and choose how you're going to approach it. Although absolutely I do agree if something awful is being said, I, you know, I do think you have to call a halt to it at the moment. But I think that uh, you really have to start with where that person is at. And you have to sort of think about what is it that you want out of this relationship? I mean, do you want it to be positive? Is it a relationship that's going to continue? Is it going to cause more hurt um, when people think that you're being really critical of them as opposed to being helpful to them? So, you know, all, it all, um, you know, you just have to sort of formulate your approach to the situation. Right. So the, um, the other kind of, the yeah, other comment ahead. also that I want to make is that somebody was describing the characteristics about Indian families and West Indian families and so on. You know, families of families. When I think of some of my Italian friends and my Portuguese friends and friends from other kinds of backgrounds, you, my Ukrainian friends, you know, some of these patterns are fairly similar in terms of, you know, marrying outside of the culture or getting connected outside of the culture. So that, you know, some of these things are not, some of these behaviors, some of the responses are actually, you know, within our society as a whole. And they're not just limited to between Indians and Blacks. So I just want to throw that in, because I'm sure you can think about some of your friends in other cultures where these kinds of issues have come up. Yeah, absolutely. Cindy, um, Cindy mentioned that if you can personalize it a little bit, as opposed to the long history 101, or, uh, you know, maybe it's not all going back to that. It's just, uh, well, we're not like that. Um, she showed her mom the video. Uh, we may have all seen it on social media. Of uh, There's a few of them, black parents talking to their children and prepping them for the world, especially in um, mm -hmm. The videos have been coming out of the States, but we know that this is the preparation that Black parents do here in Canada as well. How to act when they are with police, right? Don't wear the hoodie when you go bike riding. Make sure your hands are on the wheel. Um, make sure that you start the, the video on your phone if you can. And she showed her mom that video, and that was the only thing that kind of, she had that aha moment. And that she was able to empathize as a parent and realize, okay, hold on a sec. I didn't have to have this conversation with my brown son. So that kind of triggered something. So anything like that where we can personalize it, right? And, and try to get our parents to put ourselves and grandparents to put ourselves, put themselves in other parents' and grandparents' shoes, um, uh, black grandparents and black parents, then that, that might help as well. My mom had that same reaction. So definitely videos like that are very powerful. Right. Well, ladies, it's 928. Um, so much more we could say. This video is going to be, or has been recorded, and it is going to be up on YouTube. So you can follow uh, Brown Girl Diary on Instagram. It's at the BG Diaries, plural, and you'll be able to find this video. This is just a session one of three that we're doing. And even when we finish the third session, we're just scratching the surface, as Amal has said at the beginning. I absolutely want to thank all of our panelists because you were open, you were real. Um, you didn't hold anything back. You knew that this was a safe space. And uh, Amala, yeah, you got one, one. Go ahead. I just, I just wanted, um, I just wanted to end with um, the fact that 
I know, I see the, the comments popping up. I know there are some things that we didn't address that require yeah. a lot more depth. Um, so specifically comments about misogyny um, and patriarchy. So the fact that, you know, some of our older uncles, fathers, grandfathers won't listen to us as, as uh, female identified folks. Um, and I also wanted to mention that, um, you know, sometimes, uh, again, we talk about um, culture and community and stuff uh, within a lot of racialized communities, help seeking is discouraged. Um, some of these things, uh, specifically uh, physical violence or family violence, they require the attention of, um, they require more attention, more attention than we can um, uh, dedicate here. Um, and, and again, like I said in the beginning, this is just a conversation that kind of scratches the surface, but please, please um, take a look at the chat. There's a lot of different resources. Please know that I'm here as a resource. Like I said, I'm a social worker, I'm a therapist, um, and that if there are specific questions or concerns that come up from this, please don't hesitate to reach out. And Ashley put it there, you can uh, yeah. send uh, the BG Diaries on um, uh, Instagram, you can uh, s send them a direct message. This, of course, this conversation, just one part of allyship, right? Um, conversations are important. We can still show up at protests. We can show up at rallies. We can make donations if we're able to do so. Speak up when you see something. You know, I've been in the workplace. That's a whole other conversation. But, you know, surrounded by people who saw people saying things to me about my ex-husband or about my children or something, and I'm trying to defend myself, and they just sat there horrified but didn't say anything. So if you see something, you need to speak up. That's part of allyship as well, instead of just turning the blind eye. So next Thursday, uh, 7.30 to 9.30 again, and we're gonna, we did pretty good. I'm impressed that we stayed within our two hours. And we started on time, look at us go. <laughs> what, and we started on time. So part two next week is talking to our partners, um, Indo-Afro-Caribbean mixed partners. Um, so that's gonna be a whole other one that we're gonna have to do, and we're gonna have our panelists, and we're gonna be releasing it, who the panelists are on Sunday on Instagram. So. Um, yeah, please join us. This has been awesome. And thank you for all of your questions and comments, everybody who's been on uh, listening. And thank you once again to all of our panelists. Uh, the conversation's you. not done. We will continue. Thank you for yes. Us. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. All right. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. I can have a drink now. <laughs> <laughs> yes.